the book of Galatians, I don't need to tell you, has been uh, an intriguing one on the heels of discussing our time just before Christmas in Deuteronomy. This is our counterbalance to this glorious uh, text, uh, to that glorious text. And so now we are into a text this morning that I'm just simply calling the danger of bewitching. In the sense there is a warning of word of warning that Paul has for all of us, I think that comes as a lesson in the midst of what we are seeing in the Galatian church. If you've been with us, you know, if you've read the book of Galatians, you're aware, uh, something is going on that may, has made Paul quite upset. Paul is, to use a word irate, he is ravaging with words at the Galatians for being so foolish. I would liken, if I can use any analogy or quick illustration, supposing you were um, some sort of um, an engineer, some sort of an architect, and you had designed a fire escape on an apartment building. This is your design, and you know that it is the only fire escape. Now, every analogy breaks down at some point. Why you would build a building like that, I don't know. But at any rate, just work with me here. This is the situation. And now you've discovered in this building, somebody has put up signs that say, in case of fire, use the elevator. And you discover that these signs are everywhere and have convinced everybody in the apartment to use the elevator. Well, what would you do? How would you feel? Would you not want to respond and tell them, no, there is only one way to escape. You have been deluded. You have followed down the wrong path with wrong news. This needs to be corrected. Well, that, <clears throat> excuse me, in essence, <clears throat> excuse me, is, is what Paul is facing. That they have latched on to a message that doesn't save, that doesn't bring eternal life, that doesn't provide forgiveness of sins. This is what he has said to them in, in verse 1 or chapter 1. I'm astonished, I'm, I'm dumbfounded that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. When you read an epistle in the New Testament, sometimes it's a little bit like listening to one side of a telephone conversation. You hear one person say, mm-hmm, yeah, uh-huh, okay, I'll be there. Yeah, what should I bring? All right, mm-hmm. And you're not sure what was said on the other side of it. You have to put that together uh, given the context and when what you're seeing. And that, that's kind of how these books often feel. We don't know the whole situation of what was going on in the Galatian church, but we know from this side of the conversation that there were people there who were distorting the gospel. and. Paul has decided enough is enough. You cannot let this happen. In fact, he now uses a word that describes them in chapter three as we open this text, as we read this morning. He says, you foolish Galatians. This is, in some ways, it sounds like on the surface, like just a straight up insult. But he is actually describing the reality of what they have done. This word, this Greek word, is not a word that refers to mental deficiency. It is talking about a lack of forethought, a lack of consideration. This is not a lower IQ that he's referring to. This is a, 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 an inability or a lack of ability on their part to pay attention. The, uh, the uh, alpha negative at the beginning of this Greek word, the letter A, uh, negates this word that, that means mind. And so it's basically mindless, translated foolish, thoughtless, not thinking, not using your head, not putting your brains to work. You have not assessed anything. You've been deluded. You're not reasoning through a matter with proper logic. You've, saw, you've seen something shiny. You've found something interesting. You heard something that resonated with your flesh. There was some reason you didn't use your head. You used your heart. You didn't think this through. You reacted on emotion. And you are now being foolish. And that's the essence of what he is saying to them. They have relegated their line of thinking and they have become, in his word, bewitched. Who has bewitched you? Now, this is an interesting word because Paul is now reaching outside of New Testament vocabulary. This is the only time in the New Testament that this word is used. It is used in Greek, obviously, and it is always used in connection to some sort of an evil spell, exactly what the word sounds like. We barely use this word in English, unless, of course, you were watching that 70s TV show. It means literally 
to cast an evil spell, to exercise evil over someone. Now, I don't think Paul, given the context, is he's actually thinking that somehow there's some demonic force that has caused them to literally be under a curse or under a delusion that some... Ultimately behind it all, yes, we would say the evil one is uh, scheming and working, but Paul is using this in a, a metaphorical sense, if you will. He's talking about this idea of them being charmed or fascinated or misled in some way, that they have been deluded and bewitched, captivated. Something has captured their imagination and they've done so without using their head can almost imagine, and this perhaps is a little too sensitive or close to home to say this, but somebody who gets caught up in a telephone scam or an internet scam, you wonder why weren't you using your head? How did you get bewitched? What caused you to lose your senses and to follow down this rabbit trail that took you to nonsense? We have a personal situation and a family member of, of mine received a phone call that his son was in prison in Quebec, needed help, uh, needed to send some money, and he sent a, a very small amount of money. Then it dawned on him, maybe I should just call my son. And so he called his son, and his son answered, and he asked him, are you in prison? What are you talking about? Am I in prison? Why, why would I travel anywhere without telling you? Dad, we, you know I tell you everything that's going on. And so he, he just without using his head, got suckered into a scam. I mean, I'm not trying to suggest that um, any more, anyone's foolish when this, I mean, that happens, and I'm trying to be sensitive to it, but this is the, the idea of what is being said here. You've been scammed, and you followed this rabbit trail based on emotion, and I, can I say very quickly and very politely that this is the very same thing that still happens today? People walk away from the purity of the word based on the fanciness of a preacher, based on the, the accolades that this person might receive, the books they've written, the, the fact that they're on television, the, the largeness size of their church, whatever the case, the music, whatever the reason, some message that they've said that tantalizes their flesh. To this day, this is something that pastors all around uh, the globe that are fighting for truth are wrestling with. God's people are still bewitched. They are still captivated by things that are beyond the word of God. Can I just remind us how important it is to stay in the word? It's one of the reasons that we encourage you to read the Bible through. Get to know this book. This book is what we stand on, not ideas that we think sound interesting that have got Jesus and God words attached to it. We need the truth and the purity of the word of God and may God help us to parse that truth from this book. And by God's grace, that's what we seek to do week by week because without this truth, we are bewitched and we've chased down all kinds of trails. I don't know if you're familiar with the name Henry Ironside or Harry Ironside as he was well known, Canadian slash American who was a preacher in a Moody Bible church. I'll just give you a quote by Harry Ironside. It is quite possible for one to have been truly converted and to have begun with a clear, definite knowledge of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus. And then because of failure to follow on to study the word and pray over it, to come under the influence of some false system, some unscriptural line of teaching. And so often, when people do come under such influence, you find it almost impossible to deliver them. They seem to be under a spell. Boy, that is definitely my experience in so many places and people I've met um, everywhere that seem to just be latched on and galvanized to an idea that is unbiblical, unsubstantiated, taught by a few, a fringe notion that sounds so gloriously true, and they cling to this, 
And they hold this and have built this doctrine into their lives. And they're some of the most bombastic people who require you to believe this very truth. If you're not believing what I believe, you don't have the full understanding of things. If you've not met people like this, you've not lived long enough. This is being bewitched. And it is still a problem today. And this is what has happened. And this is what's going on. And this is why Paul is responding. You've got to cling to the truth if it isn't too late already. So let's finish verse verse two or verse one, excuse me. Foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. The reason we pause at this word here. Uh, Prographo, it actually means to write before. Publicly portrayed is the way it is uh, um, translated. To set forth or designate beforehand, uh, that's not the way it's being used here. It has the idea of to write something before the eyes of all who can read. What Paul is saying is, Christ has been explained as a billboard. Okay, this was not done in secret. I did not come and talk to one or two of you. I did not come and talk and then they spread the gospel. I did this in a public place. And I showed you publicly and clearly from the word of God how it is that Christ is the Messiah. How it is that he alone is our sufficiency. How it is that faith alone is our means of grasping this gospel and applying it to our lives. That his righteousness becomes your righteousness. I publicly showed you how the law in the book of Deuteronomy is insufficient to produce in us the righteous requirements that God requires of us. That there is an alien righteousness that we need. I showed you publicly that Christ was put on the cross to be the sacrifice for our sins, to be the means by which God's wrath is satisfied against all our ungodliness, that he became the lamb of God as seen in the Old Testament sacrificial system. I showed you this is what he's saying. Christ was publicly and loudly proclaimed. What in the world happened to you? This didn't happen under a rock and suddenly somebody comes along with another message and just like that, you've changed ranks and changed your thinking and begun to follow down a foolish path. And I'll just point out this last word of verse one. We're not spending our entire time in verse one, I promise you. But this word crucified doesn't come out in English as being anything other than past tense. And I don't want to get too technical here, but it's actually quite a fascinating um, little turn of a phrase that's found in the Greek. So just to say it this way, it is, it is the perfect tense. In English, we also have a perfect tense, but we very re- re- rarely recognize it that we're using a perfect tense. So perfect tense in English might be something like, I finished my homework. Okay, that's a a past tense word, but what that's implying is my homework is still done. That the work that I did is still completed. That there's an ongoing effect of me having finished this. Well, that is the essence of what this word is. Christ, it's in the perfect tense. Christ was crucified, but it's not, he's not saying that's a point in history and it's over with. He is ultimately pointing out that this is the sufficiency that continues to linger. That this goes on. That this crucifixion power still exists today. That this is the same means by which every subsequent generation comes to faith in Christ and finds the power of the gospel to be sufficient and finds forgiveness of sins and finds salvation. He is crucified in an ongoing sense that that work and that power of the cross still lingers. And that is all we need. And that is what Paul is trying to emphasize in this. Who has bewitched you that you haven't seen this Christ who has been crucified once for all time, for all generations with ongoing results. Again, let's quote Harry Ironside. We are not preaching the gospel of a dead Christ, but of a living Christ who sits exalted at the father's right hand and is living to save all who put their trust in him. That is why those of us who really know the gospel never have any crucifixes around our churches or in our homes. The crucifix represents a dead Christ hanging languid on a cross of shame. But we are not pointing men to a dead Christ. We are preaching a living Christ. 
He lives exalted at God's right hand and he saves to the uttermost all who come to God by him. The cross and the power of the cross still lingers. And we don't relish or celebrate a cross that has a dead Christ. We often represent our cross as an empty cross because there's life still to be given at the cross. The cross is important. It still lingers. The power of it is still there. But the power of Christ is for every subsequent generation. And Peter, excuse me, Paul, very subtly, just the use of that little tense, is pointing out to them the sufficiency. You don't need another message. You don't need to add works to it. So this is what exactly what Hebrews 10, 14 says. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Once for all, died for the saints. Galatians Chapter three, verse two. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now, this is where Paul begins to break into an argument. We'll show you some points of this argument as this unfolds, just to kind of give you a framework as you see what's going on. He uses, I think it's seven, maybe I'm wrong, but rhetorical questions. Okay, questions that... The answer seems so obvious, and this is the way he responds to them. Let me ask you this, he says. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law? How did you, what is your experience in coming to Christ? What was it in the moment that you realized that you needed Christ and Christ became your Savior? Was it in the midst of you realizing that you were keeping to the Sabbath laws, that you were watching your dietary laws, that you were making sure that you traveled to Jerusalem three times a year, that you were careful with all of the way you washed your dishes and all the clothes that you wore and on and on it went. Was that how you came to Christ? No, he says. Even by your own experience, you know. You came under the conviction of sin of the Holy Spirit who pointed out your need, that all your righteous deeds and all your efforts were not sufficient, that the law was never going to give you the righteousness you required. You recognized Christ for who he was as the only one who could cleanse you and give you that uh, imputed righteousness that would make you pleasing to a holy God. No, you didn't come to Christ through the law. So what in the world are you doing now suggesting that you still need to go back to the works of the law? How did you come to faith in Christ? You received Christ and you received the spirit of Christ by faith. This aspect of receiving the spirit of Christ, this He fleshes this out. So let's just take a moment to remind you a few verses that speak to this. Romans 8 verse 9. You whoever are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If in fact the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. You can see the triune God in that. The spirit is mentioned, the spirit of God is mentioned, and the spirit of Christ is mentioned, and these are all interchangeable. And what is Paul saying here in Romans? That the spirit of God takes up residence in your heart. That by faith, he comes into your life and he becomes the one who empowers you to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. And in fact, if you don't have the spirit of God in your life, then you don't have Christ. If you don't know what it is to have his empowerment in you by faith, then you don't know anything about Christ. You don't get this by works. You receive Christ by faith. Ephesians 1 Verses 13 and 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is a very interesting set of verses, which will not pull out too much. That word sealed has the idea of a down payment or a pledge, much like you might see an engagement ring. It's a promise, something that God gives to us to prove that we are his, that the Holy Spirit comes to take up residence in your life. You open the door to salvation and Christ himself by his spirit of God comes into your life to empower you to live out the gospel of Christ. And this spirit of God has been given to you as a down payment, as a pledge, as an inheritance that you will one day acquire uh, acquire all the possessions of heaven and the glories of God to come. So all that to say, Paul was making an argument. Let's just try to bring this back down to earth a little bit. Just to show you this argument and how it's going. Paul is just pointing out that they know they came to Christ by faith. 
He's appealing to their experience. How is it that you could be so deluded? You know salvation is by faith. So he presses on in verse 3. Let's read this again because I just want to make a point. Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? What are you doing? If you, this is the same word foolish, repeat it again. If you've begun by the Spirit of God, by faith, and you've let the Spirit of God take up residence in your life to begin to produce the fruit of the Spirit and begin to empower you to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law, do you now think that somehow if you keep an obedience to the law, somehow you're adding to something that the Spirit of God is doing? Somehow you're helping God? Let me say it this way. Uh, we moved from an area that was uh, quite well known to be a place where uh, horse and buggy Mennonites, black buggy Mennonites, as they are sometimes called, uh, lived and, uh, and set up shops and had their, their lives there. Um, some of you who live down in that part of Ontario, <clears throat> Waterloo, Kitchener, I live north of there. Uh, this is not an uncommon sight. These are connected to Amish, if you know them from Lancaster County, historically, but they're not Amish. They have a different set of rules. Let me just explain a little story to you. We had a couple come into our church. This was many years ago. Um, they were this background, but by God's grace, they came to know the Lord. They came to genuine faith in Christ, and they appeared in the church, and they asked the pastor to see the book of rules. And the pastor said, what do you mean? And they said, well, the book of rules that you have for your church. And he said, we don't have a book of rules. And they said, well, now you don't have to hide it from us. We're not going to be shy. We know your rules might be different than our rules that we had with the Mennonites, but you must have a book of rules because how do you know, how do people know how they're allowed to live and what they're allowed to do? And he tried to very graciously express to them, we actually don't have a book of rules. And they were dumbfounded. Well, how do I know how long my hair is allowed to be? Well, how do I know if I can wear pants on a Sunday? Well, how do I know if we're allowed to play baseball on a Sunday? Well, how do I know if I can ride my bike? Well, how am I supposed to know? And as far as they understood from their background, they had brought the baggage of their history into their Christian faith and understood that now they had to maintain their Christian faith through a set of do's and don'ts. Don't tell me that this isn't still alive today that you'll find Christians who tell you you should never go to the theater or you can't get a tattoo. I'm not saying any of these things are good and healthy for you spiritually, but they have their set of rules that they also take the baggage with and believe that by keeping these rules, I am now adding and assisting in my sanctification. That I began by faith, that the Spirit of God has taken up residence in my heart, but that is not sufficient. I need to now take over the job of making sure I'm holy. And I need to make sure I have my list of do's and don'ts. And I need to follow according to a life of rules and regulations. And this is the kind of legalism that many churches have been involved in. And some even of your own relatives and perhaps your own history, I don't know. But you have come up with your own set of how to live and believe that this is the, the mark of authentic Christianity. That this is the mark of how holy you are. That God is pleased and happy with you as long as you keep to the rules. I'm hammering on this because this still lingers. Because people have been bewitched. They do not understand the gospel of free grace. That your sanctification is because the spirit of God himself is sufficient to sanctify you. And your own human efforts do nothing to contribute. I need to clarify this in a few moments. But they do nothing to ultimately contribute to your sanctification. Let me quote again to Henry Ironside. Harry Ironside. Because I could not fit myself for the presence of God because I could not cleanse my heart from sin, because no work of righteousness of mine could fit me for a place with the Lord, he had to come from heaven and give himself for me on the cross. 
How then can I think of turning back to the ground of human merit as a means of securing salvation or of maintaining me in a condition of salvation before God? How could I possibly believe that this set of rules somehow has merit when I know full well when I came to Christ, my works had no merit? So what in the world am I doing now thinking that if I keep these rules, somehow this benefits me? You have been bewitched. Who has told you such a foolish notion? Now, I need to clarify something. I apologize for maybe a little slight rabbit trail here. If you're still with me and your eyes aren't too glazed over, I'm going to give you a little bit of a theological uh, definition here of a few things because it's important to understand this, whether or not you think it is or not. Uh, Again, I just tell you everything that I think is interesting, and then you pretend uh, along with me. Did I skip a slide? No, I didn't. So let me give you Paul's argument. Their sanctification is through the Spirit and not by works. What makes you think you can finish it now by works? So let me express this to you. You foolish, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Here is this little theological tale I want to give you. The difference between salvation and sanctification, it's subtle, But this is the theological truth as best as I can express it in just a few moments. Let me just give you something that you probably already understand. We recognize by the grace of God and the truth of the gospel that the work or the act, if you will, of salvation is a work of the spirit alone. Okay, we call that monergenistic. That is, if you want to be theological, that is, it is one person working. It is the work of the spirit. We are passive. Lazarus was in the grave. He didn't raise his hand and say, could you please give me a little bit of help here? Okay. He, he was utterly dependent on Christ calling him out of the grave. He was the passive recipient of that life. We opened the door to Christ and Christ, his life flooded into our lives. And we became the passive recipient of salvation by the spirit of Christ taking up residence in our hearts. I think you recognize that. That's the gospel of grace. But this is also true. So the, the act of salvation or the continuing work of salvation, sanctification, excuse me, is not a work of the spirit alone. Now this needs to be clarified. But what we mean is it's synergistic. Okay, you can't accomplish the work of sanctification without the power of the Spirit in your life. Okay, you can't. But he works in and through us to accomplish that end. And so we are never saying that it doesn't matter how you live. Look, you know, there are two ditches here, okay? Salvation of the pure gospel is in the middle, not to over teach this or go on too far. One side of this ditch is that I need to now keep my salvation and keep my sanctification and make sure I'm holy by me doing some meritorious work, me adding to this by living a righteous life and me doing it because I can do it. Okay. That's a ditch. The other side of the ditch is, well, if I've saved by grace, it doesn't matter how I live. It doesn't matter what I do. Doesn't matter, you know, sin all you want. If it's Christ who sanctifies me and him who forgives me, then who cares? No, the middle road is the spirit of God takes up residence in our lives and works with us in our sanctification. We have to daily, by faith, continually submit to that salvation. Submit to the spirit of God having control of our lives. We now walk in a living, ongoing, continual relationship that continually leads us in sanctification. Paul Paul says it this way in Philippians 3. Therefore, my beloved brothers, as you have always obeyed, so now... Not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Work out your salvation. That's not work it out because you can work and make yourself saved. It's let it be seen in your life. He's working in you, so that sanctified life needs to be worked out, needs to be seen. Let your, the, the fruit of the Spirit of God be seen in you. Sanctification 
is a dualistic work. It's only by the empowerment of the Spirit of God, but you need to agree to submit to him and put your flesh to death and allow him to produce his life in you. Let's keep working in Galatians before our time is completely gone. Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies the spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Again, rhetorical questions. Is, is everything you've done so far, is this the way, you, the road you've taken? Is this the, the road you're on now? Is this you? Is this who you are? Have you come this far only to prove that you're, 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 it's all but in vain, all your profession of faith, that there really was no substance of Christ taking up uh, residence in your life, that you now actually truly at your heart, this is what you believe? This is the road you're going to spend your whole life and only give evidence that you've abandoned the true gospel? Have you actually come to a place? Is, is pleading with them and he's asking them because heaven forbid that people should claim to know Christ by faith through grace and then take down a different road and believe somehow their efforts in sanctification and their legalistic lifestyle somehow contributes to this. It is not their error was not in thinking that they had something to do with their sanctification. Their error was in believing that they had everything to do with their sanctification. And Paul is asking this rhetorical question. Does a spirit who works miracles among you, what, what, is, what did he do while, while Paul was in their midst? We don't know. As the apostle, what, what, what miracles took place? What healings? What, what tongues were there? We, we don't know what, what all that happened in the Galatian churches. But he's asking was all of that fruitless? And that's the question still being, you could still ask yourself. If you have lived your life as a, a legalist and lived your life believing somehow that it is by your godliness, by your standard of rules, I'm not saying the ditch is over here and you just do whatever you want, but we're, what I'm saying, if you somehow believe that you've contributed to your Christianity in any measure, has this whole thing been a sham? You know nothing of the grace of God? Let me quote to you again, Harry Ironside last time. Christ is a substitute for everything, but nothing is a substitute for Christ. That is a really cool way to say it. Christ is a substitute for every effort, everything this world could offer you. He's a substitute for everything. But nothing substitute for Christ's sufficiency. Nothing, no work of your own, nothing you can provide, nothing you can bring, nothing you can satisfy God with, no human merit on your part, nothing. It is Christ and Christ alone that saves to the uttermost and sanctifies us and brings us all the way into the glory of his presence. Not because you're a good person, but because Christ in you takes bad people and makes them holy. That one day you will stand before him holy and blameless and above reproach. Not because of you, but because of him because the power of the cross, the sufficiency to sacrifice Christ, to cover every sin that you have ever committed, past, present, and future, to make you gloriously righteous and suited in a righteousness that comes from Christ alone, has been bequeathed to you, given to you, handed to you by faith. And that, and that alone is our salvation. And of course, in verse 6, which we'll not get into, just a teaser for next week. He then uses Abraham as a prototype. Just as Abraham believed God, he's quoting Genesis 15, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And so Paul continues his argument. You people have been deluded. And he begins to flesh out what is wrong with this line of thinking. And he's expressed it to them that your experience was you came to know Christ by faith. What in the world makes you think that suddenly your works would have benefit to you. It wasn't the law that saved you. Your sanctification is now by faith. You're, you were saved by, your works had no part of your salvation. What in the main world thinks that now that your works have any merit now in your ongoing life with Christ? And Abraham was saved entirely and completely and totally by faith. And we'll pick that up next week as we continue on. This is the book of Galatians.